I want to inspire the people in the pews to fall in love with the rules, <laughs> mm -hmm. to fall in love with the commandments and the teachings of the church because that's where there's freedom. It's easier to say what's not permitted because most things actually are permitted. That's a good way to right? look at it, yeah. And you think about that, of all the things that God wants us to do, I mean, we can climb a mountain, we can go to concerts, laugh at jokes, and have lifelong friendships, right? There's so many things that God made us for that is so good that our faith can actually be fun. We're not affected by a lot of the things that are going on in the world because our hope is in Jesus. Right. Welcome to the Bible Timeline Show. I'm Jeff Cavins, and today we're going to be looking at the conquest and the judges, and that is the green period on your Bible timeline chart or in your Great Adventure Bible. What an amazing period this is. This is the point where Joshua brings them into the promised land to take the promised land after 400 years of Egyptian bondage and 40 years in the wilderness. And then after Joshua dies, we've got a period of the judges where there are judges. Every man does what's right in his own eyes. No direction. They need leadership. And that's going to come in the next period, the purple period, where they get a king. But we're going to take a look at what happens when you do have poor leadership. I have a, a guest with me today, Father Mike Selinski. He is a former focus missionary, and he is a priest in Minnesota. We're going to talk about the priesthood during this time and, and ha how it applies in our life today. But if you've ever felt like you there was a lack of leadership in your life, uh, this is going to be the show for you. We're going to talk about that both in the parish and in the home. So we'll be back in just a moment with Father Mike Selinski. Good to have you. Great to be here. Yeah. So tell me about the priesthood before we get into the content here. Uh, is there anything that, that you would say after a couple of years of being a priest and you had all that preparation? You had more preparation than most people being hmm. with focus and then you know going to the seminary. But is there anything that you would say... I didn't see this coming. I didn't hmm. see that in, coming in my life. Yeah. I've, I've reflected on this actually quite a bit over the, my first year and a half or so as a mm -hmm. priest. And I think the thing that I've been surprised by the most is how much I love it. Wow. <laughs> I, uh, and how fulfilling and joyful the life really has been. Uh -huh. um, and I think I, I say that because I, when I first started thinking of the priesthood, like I said, it was probably in my early 20s. Yeah. And I always thought of it in terms of duty and sacrifice. You know, I tried dating a couple different girls during my time in focus, but then this question of the priesthood was always there mm -hmm. in the back of my mind. And, um, you know, it finally got to the point where I'm like, okay, Lord, we believe <laughs> as Catholics that you really do call young men to be priests. And I finally was just opening my heart in prayer. I'm like, am I one of those men? Like, am, am I one of them? And I, like I said, it took me a few years to kind of let go of my love of focus and to finally take the plunge and discern the priesthood. And I think because I always thought about it in terms of sacrifice. Hmm. I, I thought it was, I thought about it in terms of I was giving up a wife, I was giving up kids, I was giving up family life. But if God wanted me to do it, I guess we could get through this. We'll together, get through it. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and so I, I thought of it in such a dutiful sort of way, you know, that if it was God calling me to do it, then I needed to do it. But I, I'd say the thing that has surprised me more than anything in these first couple of years is <laughs> how much I love the life. That's, that's I fantastic. truly do. Well, t tell, tell our friends what you told me a while ago about what did you pray for? At the beginning, I don't know, was it just prior to being ordained or was it after you were ordained? No, it was your, um, the retreat. Yes. What did you pray for? Tell, tell, sure. yeah, tell us about the retreat and what you prayed for. Yeah. Um, I remember it was, I think, before we were ordained deacons or maybe it was right before becoming a priest. We had to do a canonical retreat. So it was an eight-day silent retreat. We did it at King's House in Buffalo, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Father Jeff Heward. Uh, who was my spiritual director during that retreat, he encouraged all of us to pray for a grace for the priesthood. A grace. A, a grace. Okay. Yep. Like ask the Lord for something, some sort of blessing on your priesthood. What is the grace that you want to ask on this retreat for that? 
And I remember it just struck me right away. I'm like, Lord, make me a joyful priest. Give me joy. Um, and that was just my the my prayer request, mm-hmm. you know, throughout that whole entire retreat. And so it's just, I think about this a lot because so many people will come up to me and, and just say, you have so much joy, yeah. you're a joyful priest. Um, and every time I hear that, I think back to that retreat where God has answered that prayer. Yeah. I mean, so far, yeah. like it genuinely and truly, like it's just such a joyful life. Yeah. Like I, I love the people of God. I love that he called me to this life. I'm humbled by it. Um, but it, it gives me joy to, to build my whole life on on the gospel and to try to share that with everyone that God has well, you know what, You know what's so funny is that when we were in Israel together, both my wife and I were impressed with your joy at that point. <laughs> and every, every, everywhere, everywhere he goes <laughs> on the retreat, you know he's there because there's this bold <laughs> laughter and there's this joyfulness, you know, uh, following us. And uh, you know when he has come into into the room. But I, you know, prior to having you on this show, I talked to uh, another gentleman who we all know, Edward Sri, Doctor Edward Sri, sure. and he yep. came on the show. And uh, and I I called him and I said, Have you heard, have you ever heard of this Father Mike Selensky? And he goes, oh, yeah. He said, we just brought him out to focus to speak to all the leaders. He is so joyful. <laughs> so you are now becoming the joyful yes. priest. Hey. You're, you're the, but that's good. You know, we need, we need more of that. Amen. You know, I'm reminded of the scripture, uh, the joy of the Lord uh, is my strength. Mm-hmm. The joy of the Lord mm-hmm. is my strength. And joy only comes from that obedience and that full giving of yourself sure. uh, to the Lord. So let's look at this now. We've got the conquest and the judges. And uh, I want to pick up right when Israel is on the eastern side of the Jordan in Moab. They're ready after 400 years, 40 years in the wilderness. Older generation has died out. It's the younger generation that has grown up. We're ready to go across. And what they do is they bring the Ark of the Covenant first, ahead of them, mm-hmm. with the priests. Mm-hmm. And so this sets up a paradigm where the priests are incredibly important, mm-hmm. not only to going across the river, but in life today. What's your thoughts just on that? Yeah, I think that's such a wonderful image mm-hmm. uh, of how the, the priests were leading the people, mm-hmm. even in battle, Yeah, right? Um, and I think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the kind of geographical battles of the time, I mean, the Israelites saw that as, I mean, a spiritual battle, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that was a battle of the gods, right? Mm-hmm. And I, there's something appropriate, right? That, that the priests would then be leading and surrounding the Ark of the, the Covenant, mm-hmm. right? And, and taking the people and leading them in that spiritual perspective, you know? And, and I think about that as the whole Christian narrative transforms everything, mm-hmm. you know? And there's there's not, um, you no longer look at things on a surface level, right? There's something that God is doing underneath it mm-hmm. all, right? And, and as the priest, you get to remind the people of that, right? You get right. to witness to that, uh, th- that reality. Yeah. We know as the ark went across, we, we've covered this in some of the other, other shows where we were talking about the ark of the covenant and the ark of the covenant is made of acacia wood overlaid with gold. And there are three things in that ark. And I'd like you just to comment on the three things that are in the ark. We've got the copy of the Ten Commandments. We've got the, the bowl of manna. And we have, uh, we have uh, Aaron's staff, which is budding, standing for the high priestly family. But in, in your life, and in generally speaking, the place of the Word of God mm in your life and in leading the people. Sure. Um, no, that's great. I I think since becoming a priest, uh, you know, it's just, again, only been about a year and a half. I think one of my <laughs> ongoing experiences uh, that I, I re- have or experiences, um, just the hu- how humbling it is that every single week mm-hmm. I am asked and expected to stand in front of thousands of people mm-hmm. to proclaim the word of God 
and to share a, a message about it, mm -hmm. you know, an insight about it. And, and so there's been a lot of gratitude in my life so far as a priest because it actually forces me to wrestle with scripture, to, yeah. Die, yeah. to do a deeper dive um, in a way that I don't know if I would naturally, mm -hmm. right? But every week I spend hours reading commentaries, praying with the scripture, going into uh, the chapel and asking the Lord, like, what do you want to say to your people? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that becomes my prayer. It's not like, what can I talk about? But what do you want to say to your people in this time and in this place? Yeah. And I think that it's such a joy. <laughs> like It's so humbling because I get these little moments where people will come up after a homily I might give and say like, oh, thank you for your homily today. You really inspired me to do X, yeah. you know, to stop looking at my phone more or to spend more time with my kids. Or so many people will hear the exact same message and they have different takeaways yeah. or life applications. It's like and a it's, prism. You say the message and boom, it goes out in all these different ways. Right. And it's that that humbling experience that like God is doing something here. Mm -hmm. Not me, but the 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 word of God. It's living, it active, right? That it and I see that in mm -hmm. people's lives. And so as a priest, I want to be a good steward of that, mm -hmm. right? A good steward yeah. of his word and uh, his revelation. Well, yeah, you're a proclaimer. You're a proclaimer of the word of God, the gospel, and you're you're giving out homily. Which, by the way, you give really good <laughs> homilies. Are those recorded? <laughs> no, I don't think. So. <laughs> He's laughing as he says that. <laughs> but that you you do. You give really good uh, homilies. How do you see? Do you see yourself as a priest giving a homily on a weekly basis as the point of? the parish that we're leading, where you're actually leading people in that, in that word? I think on one hand, it is kind of naturally what I think is the most important part of my week mm -hmm. because it's my touch point with th thousands of people that I might not see throughout the rest of the week. Right. I mean, it's at mass on the weekend, right? right? And for a lot of people, I think this is their, I mean, their touch point with, with God, mm -hmm. with, with spiritual things, mm -hmm. right? And so I really, I do try my best to carve out that time to pray through things and to really be a good steward of that reality, you know, because mm -hmm. my homilies, I don't know if they're eight to 12 minutes or so, but I want to make sure, I want to do my best to let God speak to them and inspire them, right? Sure. And, and hope for that little, just little mini conversion, right? Mm -hmm. And it happens for me and for uh, people in, in the pews and it's, and it's awesome. Yeah. But also at the same time, I love the fact that I'm a Catholic priest uh, because if I ever serve up a dud, <laughs> I'm not the main event at Mass, right? I'm not the uh, I'm not the primary point of Mass. My words they're not coming for you. They're not coming for me. <laughs> yeah. You know, I I I can rely on what the Mass is all about, and that's the, the Eucharist. Yeah. You know, I can pray the prayers. I can. Give the people Jesus, you know, even if yeah. <laughs> my homily didn't go as well as I hoped or wanted it. But you know, that's part of being a priest. A part of being a priest is not a priest is not an entertainer. Right. A priest is someone who is feeding and providing and, and leading the people. Yeah. And that doesn't have to, to be, you know, flashy necessarily. It just sure. has to be faithful mm -hmm. at, at providing that. So that, that's a good thing. So the word of God. Uh, they're going across the river. The word of God is going before them. But then you mentioned too, the Eucharist, yep. the Eucharist. How is the Eucharist part of the leading into the, into the promised land or mm. helping people in modern times in their own life? Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny, as you're asking that, I'm thinking about um, when... So many people along the way towards priesthood, while I was in the seminary, they would ask, ask me the question, what are you most excited about mm -hmm. uh, to be a priest? And my first response was always confession. Like I was excited to just uh, be the voice of mercy in people's lives, to, you know, to just inspire hope, to meet people in their brokenness and to absolve them from their sins. I just mm -hmm. thought, gosh, that's awesome. Because I've, I've just needed confession so many times in my life, and I couldn't wait to give that gift to other people. But it actually, I reflect, and it was my first Mass as a priest at the Church of St. Paul in Ham Lake, and it was standing at the altar that I really did take on that identity of being a priest. 
Like I actually felt like there was something that clicked where I'm like, this is priesthood, right? Mm -hmm. That I am offering the holy sacrifice of the mass, that I get to nourish the people that are here with the very body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. Like that is the priesthood, yeah. right? That I'm shepherding and bringing people to him, right? Right, And there's no, there's not, no more tangible way that I could do that. Right, right. No, that's good. And, and then the third thing is, is the Aaron's budding staff, the symbolic of the royal line, or the, not the royal line, but the, the high priestly, mm -hmm. the high priestly line. And we need priests more than, more than ever before. So as they're going across the, the river, the Jordan River, they're going to be going in and taking Jericho. And the word of the Lord right there was so important because he said, do not take anything for yourself. But one man did, Achan and everybody paid the price for it. But as people, you know, as they went across the, the river and they're gonna conquer Canaan, what do you see, even in your young life as a priest, yeah. what do you see as the, the battles that people are facing today? And then after that, I wanna find out what the connection between your role and those battles and how you might be able to help them. But just generally speaking, what are the battles? What, what are the, the Canaans that mm. people are conquering in their life. Sure. I I think I think one thing first and foremost I think that is such a challenge right in in the spiritual life or in the work of evangel evangelization is just combating that spiritual apathy. Mm -hmm. Right? And I think I loved being a focus missionary so much because it would I was for 5 years on campus and then my last year um, I was a regional director for the, the West region, but those five years where I'm on the ground meeting college students, a lot of it was just sort of activating a curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. Sparking an interest. And whether it's through friendship, through joy, through freedom, um, just walking with these, these young people, because it's a moment that you kind of start seeking in a new way, mm -hmm. you know, in a new perspective that God can, can shine his new, new life in you right? Mm -hmm. That can draw you and attract you. But I think so many people never really get to that point, that they have an idea of religion um, that is kind of rote, uh, that they might associate Catholicism or a Christian faith with um, kind of a philosophy of life, more self-help religion, maybe um, moral code, right, right. <laughs> you know, a, a system of morality. And they can think about it in terms of the rules, right? And which is a turnoff for most, <laughs> right? for for most people. For most people Does anyone right? have a religion where there's a lot of rules? I'd like to really get, exactly <laughs> join that one. And I think now more than ever, I think I see that with so many people, right? Mm -hmm. That we people don't like the rules, guidelines imposed on you. <laughs> right. Yeah, for sure. But I think even as a, a, a new priest. I, I, so many of my homilies, I think, have, have kind of encouraged a new perspective, right? Come at your faith, um, look at it again f from a, a, your adult eyes, mm -hmm. right? To the point where I hope that everyone can experience what I've experienced, what you've experienced, what so many people have experienced, that our faith can actually be fun, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? That all these connections in scripture, they're just fascinating, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and so there's such... Apathy, spiritual apathy, I think, in our, our culture. When you say apathy, kind of drill down on that for a moment. Sure. When you say apathy, and we're talking about young adults, you know, mm -hmm. in the world today, how would you describe that apathy? Well, I think I, uh, maybe these two ideas are related, right? The rules, mm -hmm. um, that perception of uh, religion as autonomous or um, that it would be able to speak into your life. People run away from that, mm -hmm. you know, especially, I mean, millennials, Gen Z, we don't like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. We want to do our own thing. Um, and we don't want uh, an authoritative body like the church to tell me what I can and cannot do. Right. Mm -hmm. but, but, I, but I also think that the world has such a strong pull on young people, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we send all these young people to universities and that's where they just kind of walk away it. from their faith, right, right? Right. And most cultures on, uh, on college campuses or universities across the country aren't inspiring or instilling this desire for religion, mm -hmm. you know? 
it actually portrays it in a very kind of oppressive sort of way. Mm -hmm. And I and I I think that that creates that spirit of skepticism or apathy amongst young people. Right. You know, and and I think young people can be so attuned to just their daily lives, right? right? That they, they... The phone. I don't know how often they think about eternity, mm -hmm. you know? But then I get these moments as a priest where, I mean, funerals, what an, what an opportunity, yeah. right? That people are contemplating death and the afterlife. And I think that when uh, the church fills with friends and family of the deceased, they wonder, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they're in that, that, that moment. They're just like, is their life after death? Sure. Is this it? You know, so that whatever whatever it is, I just always hope and pray that there could be that moment of curiosity or a spark of just like wonder. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, in the conquest and the judges, uh, both are both of the the narratives in conquest and judges do relate to leadership, and we're talking about the priestly leadership here. They do relate to the leadership. They conquered with the priests leading. Joshua ends up dying at the end of Joshua. And then we have the book of Judges where there is no apparent leader anymore. And it says, the people did what was right in their own eyes. You mentioned apathy with yeah. uh, uh, Gen Z and, mm -hmm. and uh, millennials. But their, their view of authority, their view yeah. of people who have authority, whether it's in the church or whether it is political uh, or, or whatever. What is their, what do you think their view is? Yeah, that's... Because the leadership is so important. I've, I have been reflecting on that quite a bit, mm -hmm. um, that there is such a, yeah, a skeptical heart uh, towards authority um, mm -hmm. in, our, in our culture today, especially amongst young people, Yeah, right? That we almost made a, a God out of personal autonomy and... Uh, moral relativism just is the standard mm -hmm. sort of way of looking at the moral life, mm -hmm. right? That it's that I'm the one that can determine what's right and wrong for me, you know? And you can do and that. That's for what you. it said in Judges, too. Everybody right? did what was right in his own eyes. Right. And I, and I think, and I've given so many homilies again on this, that I want to inspire the people in the pews to fall in love with the rules, <laughs> mm -hmm. to fall in love with the commandments and the teachings of the church, because that's where there's freedom, right? right? That's where we get direction to live the best possible life mm -hmm. that we're meant to live. God made us for a purpose, right? We have natures, we have wills, um, we, we have a, a final cause, we have an end, mm -hmm. you know? And we're only gonna discover that through what God has revealed to us. Right. And he's yep. done so through the teachings of the church. Yeah. The very thing that they are repelled by is the very thing that can set them free. Free. Yep. And you, you mentioned the autonomy, and I think that's an interesting concept, particularly in the period of the judges, because every man did what was right in his own eyes. And I don't know of any time in history where each individual has the opportunity via social media, Facebook, Instagram, whatever it might be, sure. to be almost everything that society is. They can be the director, the producer, they can be the talent, they can they have their own show. They mm -hmm. brand themselves. Mm -hmm. And the idea that I would submit myself to others seems to go against this idea of gaining likes or sure. you know notoriety of, in, in any way. So it, it really is, I think, a difficult situation. I am my own leader. Right. Yeah. And I'm the one who determines what is good or not good, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. right or wrong. Right. What would you say to someone? What would you say to uh, someone in their early 20s that says, uh, uh, I like, I'm, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Yeah. You've heard that before? I have definitely. I, you know, I'm spiritual. I'm lot. spiritual, but yeah. not religious. In the work of evangelizing, right, mm -hmm. as Catholics in the world, as witnesses, we all have that calling right. uh, given to us at our baptism, that we're participants in this great commission and to, to spread the gospel to the world. And if we can be people that witness 
to the freedom and the joy and the peace that comes from um, submitting ourselves to something something and someone greater than ourselves, mm-hmm. I think that will go a long way in the world. And I think you see so many um, young people, especially, gosh, it was just so fun being on college campuses and seeing life after life transformed by God. Mm-hmm. And when they come into the church, there's an attraction almost to the tradition of the church. You see a lot of young people entering the church today and they, they love the liturgy they, because it's something set apart from the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, that their journey into the church, they want to belong to something so much bigger than themselves, mm-hmm. right? Something that's tried and true and substantial in the midst of our topsy-turvy world where everything gets flipped upside down yeah. and can change in a second, yeah. right? Yeah. They want to belong to something solid. And I, I think that the church satisfies that desire mm-hmm. in young people. And I think if we witness to that through our peace, that we're not, we're not affected by a lot of the things that are going on in the world because our hope is in Jesus, right? Right. Yeah. So what you're saying basically is that the when it comes to witnessing to an autonomous generation, you know, of, mm-hmm. of people who feel that that they have everything within themselves that they need for for life, is not so much engaging theologically with a new language and these concepts and so forth, which are good, mm-hmm. and some some do respond to that, but it's it's your life. Mm-hmm. It's the joy you have. It's the living of it that becomes the attractive thing. Yeah. And you know, it reminds me of what uh, Peter said: to always have uh, a reason for the hope yeah. that is within you to those who may mm-hmm. those who may ask. So it, it is. And you know, when I was going to you were were you at Seek twenty four this past yeah. year? No, oh. it was the year before that. Oh, okay, but not this one. When I was there, it is it's overwhelming almost. It's I know. Like, I know. Wow. What and was it, 24,000 people or something? Some, at, something like at Adoration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you you go there and you see that, and you see the transformation that's taking place as they bend their knee to God. I know. There's not people running around with you know, Greek and Hebrew and Latin. And they're, they're just bowing the knee to Jesus. Lives are transformed. They look around, and it becomes contagious. Amen. And it's so hopeful. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 sometimes when, if you're ever skeptical about the future of the church, come to a focus conference, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, it really is inspiring. But I, back to that, that idea of obedience and submission, I think about, mm. um, I, I was just so inspired actually by uh, my brother and my sister-in-law. Um, they struggled with infertility for many years. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was about 15 years of marriage uh, that they weren't able to uh, conceive. And, you know, my sister-in-law one time reflected to me, and I just love this so much. She said so many people that she worked with would come and say, you know, have you ever thought about in vitro fertilization? Have you ever thought about surrogacy? And her response would simply just be, that's not an option for us. And she told me, that she, she was never more grateful for the church mm. in those moments because she didn't have to figure out if these things were right or wrong or God's plan or not. Mm-hmm. The church laid it out. The church uh, revealed that to, to, to them. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to stay with the church. And there was freedom and there was peace there, right? Um, and I think right before they turned 40, they conceived, they just... Uh, had um, my nephew about four years ago, little Patrick, and his middle name they gave him is Jonathan Joseph. Mm. And they loved that name Joseph so much because they really believed that this was a beautiful act of um, a a gift from God for obedience, Mm -hmm. right? And Joseph is just that wonderful example of obedience, right? But I just loved that perspective that she loved the rules of the church it helped her. It helped guide her. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. I think you know when, when you're looking at the commandments, like at Sinai, God gives the Ten Commandments. He gives His law, and 
What a lot of people don't understand is that it's not God from the outside imposing rules on you because one, he doesn't like you. Two, you're out of control. He just wants to control you. You know, three, he just wants you to be different than everybody else. Those are not the reasons, but it's because he loves you <laughs> and he's showing you how to not just be in a relationship of God and people, but a covenant relationship, which is a giving of ourselves. He gives himself to us. We give ourselves to him it's a bridal spousal relationship. So for, for married life, when I, when I take a, a, a vow to my wife and I, I give myself over to the commandments of God, it is from within the covenant. I want to do these right. things. I don't want to worship any other God. I don't want right. to kill. I don't want to bear false witness. I don't want to do any of these right. things. Why? Because of the relationship, not because I'm being I'm being controlled yeah. by God. And everyone else gets to lie. Everyone else gets to kill. Everyone else gets to do these things. No, it's because of the relationship. It's within a marriage or a covenant relationship. Mm -hmm. And so when you hear the Ten Commandments, you are, you are confessing your love in what you will do and oh, not, great. And yeah. not do, right. you know? And so if, if millennials today or Gen Zers today yeah. look at, well, that's the church filled with uh, rules, yeah. well, then I can turn right around and say, well, your parents... They're just, that's just a marriage based on rules. <laughs> right. You can't go out with other women. You can't do this. You can't do that. Right. And, and that's just not the way it is. And so what do you think the key is for Gen Z and millennials to see, because this is a time, the conquest in Judges is a time where there is a huge emphasis put mm -hmm. on walk my way, walk according to my way. What do you think the key is to getting over this hump yeah. so that they understand, I'm not inviting you into a rule book. Yeah. I'm inviting you into a love relationship. Amen. Oh, that's so great. I love how you just articulated all of that. Um, and I think that the, the enemy, I mean, from the very beginning, right, in mm -hmm. the Garden of Eden, he, what does he focus on? I mean, the one tree that's forbidden. Yeah. You know? And not all of the trees <laughs> that you can eat of in the garden. Yeah. And I love that. Those are uh, wide open. <laughs> G.K. Chesterton, he, he, he says something like the Ten Commandments, they're not indicative of the rigidity and uh, the rigidity of religion mm -hmm. um, or the closed mindedness of religion. Um, it's, they're indicative of the humanity and the liberality of religion. It's easier to say what's not permitted because most things actually are permitted. That's a good way to right? look at it. Yeah. And you think about that, of all the things that God wants us to do, I mean, we can climb a mountain, we can swim the ocean, we can climb trees, we can cook, we can go to concerts, we can enjoy a beer or a glass of Cabernet, mm -hmm. like we can laugh at jokes and uh, have lifelong commitment, uh, friendships, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's so many things that God made us for that is so good, yeah. right? And it's because God loves us right. and he wants the fullness of our joy and our in our life. Yeah. And the the things that are forbidden <laughs> is precisely what you said. It's because he loves us. Yeah. And it goes against our nature to sin, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to do these things because we love God and we actually want freedom. And God wants our freedom too. Yeah. One of the key one of the key uh scriptures in the conquest was one that's not one of the narrative books. It's Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are, are get a little bit sidetracked when they hit Deuteronomy. What's this, <laughs> what's this really about? And some of these stories I've heard a little bit before. And you know, Deuteronomy is the second law. It is the last, last gift, I guess you could say, of Moses to, to the movement. But as they were getting ready to go across the Jordan, uh, Moses said a couple of things, that if you're going to be successful over there, and when you go over there, by the way, they sacrifice babies over there mm -hmm. to Moloch and other gods. Mm -hmm. When you go over there, they're going to want your sons and daughters mm -hmm. to be a part of what they're doing. Wow. And he said, 
He said, uh, there are two things. One, hear, O Israel, Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's only one God, and that is the key to taking Canaan, that you're going to go over there and there's going to be multiple gods. Mm. That's a killer. That'll kill the movement right there. Mm. There's only one God, and the second was, you got to teach your children. Yeah. You got to teach your children. From the parish perspective and being a priest, let's talk about those two things for a moment. One is there is only one God. Mm -hmm. So what do you hear are the competing gods mm -hmm. for our people today? What are the, the, what are the things that they're giving themselves to that are taking them off mark yeah. as far as worshiping the one, the one true God? Sure. I mean, gosh, it's just the devil likes to keep us busy, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. we're just so preoccupied with other things, yeah, right? And I just, I can see that in our, our culture, and it's just we inherit it, like, right? I mean, the 40-hour work week, kids running around in all of their activities. Kids' sports has changed so much it's changed Sundays. since I've been a kid. <laughs> yeah. Holy cow. Like, yeah. usually Sunday, I mean, Sundays used to be protected, and they're not at all anymore, mm -hmm. you know, and that, and you're traveling to out of state tournaments for elementary school kids mm -hmm. involved in their sports. So sports might be one? I think sports might, <laughs> might be just a, might be. Might be one of those. And uh, I love sports. Uh, I love what sports I, I even though you're a Viking a good, fan. It, it, yeah. You know, perseverance. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So sports sports is definitely can be a god sure. for people with shrines in their bedroom or their garage and they're, they're, they they adorn adore the outfits and everything. It can be, right? It can be. What would be another one? Gosh, I think um, <laughs> we live in just such a comfortable world right mm -hmm. now, right? Like it's, we, I mean, all of the advance, advances in um, technology and entertainment. Yeah. You know, I mean, we can order food, DoorDash, to be delivered to us. We don't even have to okay, get You mentioned car three either. there. You got food can be <laughs> yeah, that's what, an idol. Yeah. Entertainment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can be I mean, an idol. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, there is an endless network technology of things that yeah. we can watch and mm -hmm. stream and be entertained by. Right. And these aren't evils, but they're, I mean, if they become idols, right? If they actually, mm -hmm. um, I think, supersede our, our love of God. Yeah. Or even our pursuit of our faith, right? Right. I mean, then they they get out of whack. Yeah. So you have you have all of these false gods. So let's go back to Israel for a moment. They're going across the river, and they're supposed to worship Yahweh, one true God. But they go over there and realize, wow, there's a sports god. There's a technology god. <laughs> huh. There's an entertainment god. There's a food god. You know, <laughs> all of all of these. That if they huh. if they give themselves over to that. They are going to fail God's mission just like that. They're going to fail the mission. Sure. Because part of being faithful to God's mission is saying, saying yes to God is saying no to a lot of other things. And that's what the Blessed Mother did. She said, be it done unto me according to your word. And she could not have fulfilled her role had she been worshiping all these other things. Wow. In that's, her life. That's so good. So, so you have these these things that people are, fi are really struggling with in their life. What about teaching children? Hmm. What, what's your observation these days about the, the role of parents teaching their children? And how does the priesthood come into that yeah. as far as forming them? Yeah, I've been really grateful that uh, the parish that I'm at, St. Vincent de Paul in Brooklyn mm -hmm. Park, uh, we're just all kind of united in that vision, right? Uh, that... In order for the kids to embrace and love their faith, it's actually going to come through the parents, mm -hmm. right? The parents are the primary educators of their children in all things, mm -hmm. <laughs> first of all, but most especially the faith. Right. And so I, I'm really excited. We actually just changed our faith formation model at the parish this past year. Um, we used to do the, the typical sort of CCD drop-off model where... Parents would come with their kids, drop them off for an hour, hour and a half on mm -hmm. Wednesday nights, 
maybe stay in the parking lot, maybe drive home, maybe go to Starbucks. They call Starbucks. Starbucks parents. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Run some errands. And then they come back and they pick up the kids and they might ask the kids, what did you learn today? And the kids might probably say, uh, I don't know. Yeah. And then the parents have nowhere to go with that, right? right? Um, and the reality is, I mean, this generation, my generation, um, there's so many people that just never had that moment of really being catechized and formed as adults, right? right? And so there's a lack of confidence, I think. On the parents. On the parents' side of things. And I don't, it's the church can teach my kids um, the, the, the faith. Right. And, and therefore I'm doing my duty, you know? And there's something so good in that, right? They, mm-hmm. they care enough. There's something, they know it's important that their, their, their kids um, receive the faith, right? But... I mean, we have to reflect how effective is it really, you know? Right. Because it's got to be instilled in the culture of your home, uh-huh. right? That yep. you carve out a space, you carve out time that y- your kids can say, like, our family believed and made it important, mm-hmm. more important above all other things, right? Yeah. And that is when these young people go off to college, they'll have something to hold on to mm-hmm. that's substantial because the parents believed, they taught them. And they witness to it, even if it's not perfect. Mm-hmm. I mean, you don't have to be a theologian to teach your kids. No, you know what I mean. Yep. You can be learning alongside with them, mm-hmm. but even if you just carve out the space to do it, you're communicating something to your kids. Right. That we are a house that seeks the Lord. Yeah. You know, and even if you're just praying together as a family, yep. and even if it, if the lessons go. <laughs> you know, they're a little messy or they don't go the best. It's okay. Right. Because we we're trying. And that communicates so much. Yeah. Appreciate that. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, I want to learn a little bit more about you and the Bible and your relationship with the Bible. And we're going to have to get that here. I think you hit it back somewhere, but we're going to get it. I got it. And uh, I want to hear about that. And then we do have some questions from our from our viewers. So we're going to be right back. I think you're going to enjoy this. We'll be back. The Old Testament makes up over half of the Bible, and yet it can be very difficult to understand. I'm Andrew Swafford. And I'm Jeff Cavins, and we, along with a couple of our fellow Bible scholars, wrote a Catholic Guide to the Old Testament just for that purpose. Through a Catholic Guide to the Old Testament, you will become better acquainted with the author, main characters, important points of each book of the Old Testament to bring more clarity to the Old Testament. And it even uses the color-coded Bible Timeline Learning System, which is also used for the Bible in a Year podcast with Father Mike Schmitz and myself. And one great thing about this book is not only does it take you to the there and then, it also shows you how the New Testament uses each book of the Old Testament and how each book of the Old Testament is used in Catholic tradition. Understanding each of the individual books of the Old Testament will help you possess a deeper knowledge of the Bible and a greater view of the big picture of God's plan of salvation, which ultimately brings you closer to God. You can order today at ascensionpress.com slash Old Testament. So I want to know, we've, t- we've talked a lot about priesthood, of course, in the Conquest and Judges. There's your Bible. Tell us a little bit about your relationship with Scripture. Uh, I'm not talking about reading on Sunday, just you as a guy. Sure. Well, I think... I might have said it earlier um, or not, but I I think in my years in focus, I'm just so grateful. Um, In so many of our Bible studies and our trainings, Mm -hmm. you would come down to focus new staff training and teach us. Scott Hahn, uh, I used to do his fourth cup Bible study with my uh, students at Harvard, and they loved it. And I think for me, it was just an ongoing journey, kind of starting in my my missionary years, Mm -hmm. that Scripture became... Fun, <laughs> like I agree. It, it is when you not make, a bad way to spend your life. But <laughs> I can't do that really on my own. You know, like I, I think just reading it from cover to cover. There's just so many things naturally. Just as Mike Zelensky, I'm gonna miss right. Yeah. And so it was just it. I think in my my focus years, just having that kind of extra formation and help with just learning about scripture Mm -hmm. that gave it a new light and new life for me, right? Right. Um, And then another, I I mean, way of reading scripture that was just so helpful to me, because I think, 
I mean, I, I, I went to a Baptist school growing up, kindergarten through 12th grade, and we had a uh, scripture memory verse uh, every week that we had to have a part of scripture, scripture memorized wow. and we get tested on it. Um, and so I, I knew some scripture, um, but I didn't really know how to really read the Bible. Yeah. Right, that's like big, I guess I that's just a didn't huge really know problem how. for most people. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, but one of the things that I also learned in my focus years was just the the process of lexio divina, mm-hmm. right? Of just really praying with scripture in a meditative, reflective right. way. Um, that's not reading it like a chapter book, but you you choose a passage and you you go deep mm-hmm. and you let God inspire and speak to you through it. Oh, that's beautiful. Do you have any favorite verse? Is there yeah. like a life verse or a favorite verse? or I know what mine is. I got a couple okay. that I come back to. I think one of my favorites is Romans 8, 28. You know, we believe that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. That's beautiful, yeah. Everything works together for good. And it's just such a hopeful verse I come back to and I try to leave with people when they're in the midst of something that they're going through, something that they're carrying, something that they're struggling through, yeah. something that they can't make sense out of. Mobile right? counseling. <laughs> yeah. Just give them that word. Oh, on it. But God is working something good. Yeah. S- something good. He is working through this because He loves you, right? Right. And and I I love that verse too because I mean if you think about it, it's the whole basis of our Christian faith. Right. Out of the the crucifixion and torture and mockery and death of. Jesus God was, was working God, something God good. himself. God was working something good. Yeah. By the way, that that's a word. <laughs> that's a word from the Lord to you. You're watching right now, and maybe you're thinking to yourself, man, I just mm-hmm. would wish the Lord would, would, would say something in my life. Yeah. Well, he's working something for the good Yeah. for you right, right now. So I just felt a need to say that to you yeah. today. So mm-hmm. uh, any... Uh, I like that. Was there any other verses that were kind of... Well, I mean, tied to that, and this whole same concept, right? I I love the story of Joseph Mm. in the Old Testament, Mm -hmm. right? And how he gets sold off to slavery by his own brothers, and he's apart for them for how many years? I I don't quite know. Mm. His family comes back, right? And he says, what you intended for evil, God intended for good, right? That even in the midst of evil, God can use our sin if we put it in his hands, Mm -hmm. right? Like... He can bring me closer to him somehow, miraculously, even through our deepest, darkest regrets and mistakes, right? right? Okay, so besides Jesus and Mary, who do you most identify with in the Bible? Who's that one character where you say, something about him or her that I see in me? Yeah, I mean, I got to say Peter. Really? Right? I mean, I just did a little men's study, actually, at the parish Mm -hmm. where we walked through uh, the life of Peter together. And all of us are just sitting there just like, ah, oh, he's so relatable, right? Um, that this is the guy that Jesus built his church on. Okay. You know, our first Pope. Right. Mm-hmm. And you see, you see the ways that he screws up. <laughs> you see, I mean, his mistakes are just there for the whole world to see, right? Mm-hmm. But look at the great saint that he became, right? An evangelist. And I... I find a lot of hope <laughs> in a lot of things that Peter does throughout Scripture for myself. We do have some questions. Here's Suzanne's question. I noticed the cycle of sin in Judges. My question is, why don't they get it? Why do they keep repeating the same problems or sin? If you're wondering why they keep repeating the same sins, Go look in the mirror, <laughs> because that's what I did. You look in the mirror and you think, why do I do that mm-hmm. over and over? Whatever it might be, you name the sin, you have to feel the same way, I would think. You know? <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I obviously see that in my own life and my sure. own need for confession over the years. But I mean, <laughs> right? I mean, usually people aren't coming to confession confessing brand new sins a mm-hmm. lot. It's a lot of, you know, we're struggling through the same stuff, right? Right. And uh, I think there's something actually, I mean, God lets us struggle, right? Because we can realize our need for him, mm-hmm. right? To bring us to our knees, our posture of begging the Lord, 
you know, still again and again and again to never get tired of inviting him back into the, our life, you know, mm-hmm. and coming before him in our woundedness and our brokenness and our mistakes. Mm-hmm. And I think of, I mean, St. Paul, right? Uh, the thorn in his side. Three times I begged the Lord to remove this thorn, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and God didn't, right? Mm-hmm. And he allows us to kind of struggle and wrestle, mm-hmm. right? But hopefully always so that we come back to him right. for that grace and With healing. Victory. Yeah, I think, he, I think he allows us to struggle, but he wants us to be victorious, Yeah, you know, um, in, a, in a sense. I know you're not saying this, but it's not like, uh, okay, you're, you're, you're struggling with this sin. I forgive you. Now go back out there and struggle again. <laughs> right, you know, right. the idea is it's the woman caught in adultery yeah. in John's gospel. Where are your accusers? They're not here. I don't accuse you either. Go and do not sin again. That's right. the goal, you, That's the you know, goal. for it. But then the question is, well, I'm back. <laughs> sure. I'm back. And how do you break that repeated sin? I think about one of the penances I've been trying to give out a little bit more frequently is just even my, my own prayer life, how much I love to come back to John 15. Mm. You know, mm. I am the vine, you are the branches. Right. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Remain in me. Abide in me. Remain in me. Uh, And I tell you all these things so that your joy may be complete, so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. And just reminding people, build your life on Jesus. Yeah. You know, like we don't need to – I mean, don't focus all your energy on the sin itself. Focus on the Lord, right? Change your perspective. Change your gaze. Yes. Look at him, and he's going to help you. Boy, it's been good talking to you. And, it's been uh, fun. Uh, we, we've come from uh, Israel, and you were a pilgrim to today. <laughs> and uh, it's just so so wonderful to, uh, to see what God has done in your life. And one of the reasons I wanted you to come on the show was just to, to demonstrate, I think, to people that you might be on a particular track. But God has a call in your life, and you may end up doing something that you never thought you would do, yeah. speak to people you never thought you'd speak to, and to do things you <laughs> never thought you would do. Amen. You know? Because you can you could get... Like coming on this show. <laughs> <laughs> would you mind closing us out in prayer and... For sure. And giving our, our wonderful friends a blessing? Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father... We come before you and we're just so grateful for the gift of our faith, uh, for everything that you've done for us, the ways that you've transformed our lives and have inspired us to seek you more fully, to follow you uh, throughout this life. Uh, We ask for the gift of your Holy Spirit to continue to lead us and guide us. Uh, We pray for all those who have listened today, uh, who have tuned in, whatever they carry in their hearts, on their minds, whatever their fears are, their worries, their burdens, uh, that you would be near them, near, near them, that they would know of your friendship, of your love, of your care. We pray that you continue to make the church holy, help us to respond to your, your call in all things, and follow you wherever you lead. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. It was really good. Thanks. Thank you for watching. If you would like to see more amazing content on the Bible, be sure to like and subscribe.